Yes, welcome back to our fourth and final introductory session to the Unix shell and Bash in particular. Um, we will be talking today about conditionals and scripts. Uh, there were a few things, a few questions from last week um, that I noticed. Uh, one was uh, about variables. Is it possible to, um, to for a child process to change um, the contents of a variable of its parent? And the answer is no, it's not. Um, I was initially a little bit apprehensive of saying this so unequivocally um, because there is the read command and just noticed something. Uh, no, too late. Um, there is the read command which obviously sets a variable in the in the shell itself. So if I share my screen, so if, if I have um, I, I have I don't have name set, if I say say read name, and then enter it, enter it, then um, it is set. But um, read is actually a built-in command, so it's part of the of the bash itself. Uh, it's here, so. All the built-in options um, and read would read would be somewhere in here. RS read read there. So no, it's not possible to um, to set this um, uh, to to set a variable in a child process. Okay, so um, at the end of last week. We looked at um, exit codes or return codes. That's an integer number that a process that a program returns to the to the to its parent shell. And we said that we, we found out that an exit code of zero generally means a success, and anything else uh, is an error or at least some sort of abnormal result. Now the programmer of that program has to define what means a success and what kind of integer values to return and which kinds of, of abnormal behavior. Maybe close the door. Um, but that is that is the convention and that is really useful. And we can use that if we want to trigger a second command only upon the correct uh, uh, completion of the first. So for example, Let's say we want to delete a file locally only after we make sure that we've successfully copied it somewhere else. Okay, and that is sub that is very easy to do. Um, so, for example, um, if we have uh, let's say we want to copy let's see, G that and then we use the double ampersand to say only if that command is successful do I want to execute the second one um, yeah. so um, you notice that I made a mistake here I, call, I called the file wrong by the, with the wrong extension, and for that reason, it has not deleted the second command. The, the remove command has not executed. So already that was um, so it's, already that was that that helped me. Uh, and now we have um, the the pizza.cfg was uh, deleted after the successful copying to um, of course locally it doesn't make sense because we can ju just use M mv command to do that in one go but um, if you want to transfer to a remote server um, or something like that then this might be something you might want to use so we've already seen the um, 
how it works. We can also see um, we can we can also use this with an ls command in this case. So here I'm just listing the file pizza.cfg and then um, only execute the, the echo command conditionally of the of the ls giving a correct return. So for example, if I wanted to use that if I wanted to do, do this with a file that doesn't exist, um, ls uh, ls gives a non-zero return code, and therefore um, the second part the second part is not executed. Similarly, we can also say um, we can also try to run the second command only if the first one fails. So, for example, we can do L and for that we use two we use the two horizontal uh, vertical bars. So again, two characters. And this, we don't get sorry because pizza.cfg is there. But if I try to do meet pi.cfg, um, because that file doesn't exist, um, I get I get the, the the command here in the second one. Now, um, uh, one thing I've prepared just this morning is a big folder of files. That's an, and you can assume that these are files that you've generated over a model run or something like that, and you want to process some data. And you have a program called Process Data that takes um, where you give the uh, where you give the file and it writes something out, but it also does some internal processing, maybe saves it to a different file. And if you want, if you want to do that on the whole on all the files here, um, we we've uh, known we knew from yesterday how to use a for loop to do that. So for f in star uh, in star do process data dollar f done. And this processes all the files in this directory. And it looks good, but there is a problem. Because if I I have, of course, manipulated one of the files. It's a correct. It's a corrupted file. And and the um, and the program, the process data, notice that this was an abnormal result. The process data is programmed in such a way to give a non-zero exit code if it fails. But because every process was a new process again. Um, I have not noticed that. So if you if you look at the at all of this, um, all of the output in, if you pipe all the output into an ls command, then you can see yes, this, it it actually wrote in here that this is a corrupted file, but um, we simply didn't notice because it just was scrolling past too far, past too fast, and we weren't we weren't really paying attention. And one thing that we can do is again using these um, using these uh, pipes. So the easiest one would be to just enter the read. Read without anything else just pauses for this for for the user to press return. So whenever this this process now fails, it just asks me to return. And if I now run run this, it says, "Oh, corrupted file." I get the error message and it pauses. And then I press enter, and then it continues with the other things.
Now, going back to the uh, to the meat pie and pizza thing, um, what we've had, what what we've done here was uh, we were always getting um, the output of the ls command before we got the error code. So what if we just if we don't want to do this? Now, for example, for files, there are better ways to find out whether the file exists. And for that, we have the test command. The test utility evaluates the expression, and if it evaluates the true returns a zero, exit status, otherwise it returns false, a one. And you can see there are a lot of, of options that we can test. But in this case, all we want to find true if the file exists regardless of type. So we can say test minus e pizza.cfg and echo yummy. So now I, I t it tests whether the file exists. Uh, and it doesn't write yummy if it doesn't. We can even chain them. And uh, do like uh, and work like that. So let we can def we can do that inside a loop as well. Case we've um, we've put this into a, into a um, a loop to check whether we have um, whether the file exists and printed certain things depending on the um, on the output. So if we go back to the manual. We can also see there is a second way to run it, and that's with square brackets. That's actually the same thing. Say Olga. Then, yes. Um, could you please explain why, in the the previous uh, example uh, with test e food, um, why in some cases you put curly brackets and some other cases not? Ah uh, yes. Um, I. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. I, I'm, in this case, it's uh, here. I've not used curly braces. Here, I have. Um, in here, it doesn't really make a difference. Sometimes I. This one is obviously easier to type, and this one is, um, and this one is uh, more precise. In here, it would probably still have worked. In here, it probably would have still have worked if I had left the curly brace out because it now ended in a in a period, and periods are not part of, of variable names. So Bash would have noticed that it's that it's ended. Um, but here, I could have here I um, I could have not used the curly braces. So the curly braces you you need to use them if you have. And we talked about this this last week. Um, if you have uh, something like that. If if you if you want to have the variable 
the, the contents of the variable immediately followed by other things. Okay, thanks, Olga. Um, so this, for example, would not could not self-reflect because Bash would not know that it, that you only want to have the variable called foo followed by the literal characters B A R. Whereas if you do, did something like um, this then it would work because now um, Bash would know, okay, only foo is the name of the variable and bar is just, uh, is, it comes just directly afterwards. So you're right, um, it was confusing, but um, if in doubt, use the curly brace it, braces, but if it's simply one word specific, especially when surrounded by spaces, you can just use dollar, you can leave the curly braces uh, out. Thanks. So, um, one thing about test, um, what you have to be careful for, if you, um, what, what's, what's a common mis uh, mistake? So say, you say file equals pizza.cfg, and you then say test minus e um, dollar file, and you can do, do it either way. Uh, in this case, I don't need to curly braces. So this works now because file pizza.cfg is a file that exists. So it uh, it prints uh, yes. If I'm unsetting the file, if there's no, nothing in file anymore, and I run this, it still prints yes. And that is. Um, a common uh, mistake that you do, because if file is empty, it translates to test minus e. And that is interpreted as test whether the co whether minus e is a non-zero string. So that's, that's a little bit confusing. What you have to do in this case is to surround dollar file in Quotation marks, and then it um, and and that would be uh, come, that would bash would change that to this, and this means that it does get a second argument. There's just nothing in there. That's just a second uh, an empty variable, an empty argument, and that works. So if you use variables inside um, a test. You usually you, you want you want to uh, surround them with double quotes. Okay, um, so what is the difference between te test and the and the square brackets? Well, there isn't internally there is no difference, but most of the times where this test is actually used is inside an if statement. So let's say you want to do more than just one thing if a process failed. So let's say you want to say, uh, so you want to print several lines or you want to do something else as well. And that is where the if clause comes in. And you can do something like if test minus um, e I'm not using uh, uh, not using quotations because I write something in there. Um, semicolon, just like before. Then, and I can now. I'm and I'm, I'm indenting here because um, that's just that just makes it easier to understand. The bash doesn't need it. Um, you can also see that Bash has, again, just like the for loop last week, has noticed that this line does not make the comp is not a complete complete command. It expects more, so it's um, it's prompting me with the continuation prompt, um, the the um, right arrow, and I can say other thing. Um, And, and I can continue doing more commands that will only be executed if the pizza.cfg exists. 
And then I can even put in an else clause. But to end it, to end the if clause, I'm writing fi, so if backwards, and that finishes, and that finishes the, the if clause, and um, because pizza.cfg exists, uh, it has now, um, it, it has written this. Now, if I were to to rename pizza.cfg, so pizza.cfg does no longer exist. If I now go up and Again, it has uh, concatenated all of the, the whole command into a single line, but that's the same thing. I run the same command. Now it says pizza.cfg does not exist. So it has now gone into this one down here. And that, but, but just for programming purposes, it's far more, con it's, it's far more useful to, u to use brackets. Just make sure that you always leave a space bef before and after this. Um, so this is this is this is a, a syn that, that looks very con very much like the syntax you would use in a in any other program, Fortran. Python, C. Um, it's a little bit different. Uh, not many use the the fi to end the to end the if clause, but um, it's it's far more con uh, it's far more easy to recognize what it is. So. Um, are there any questions so far? Is it possible just to get the Boolean straight back, or do you have to pipe it, or do the ands to echo it exists? Sorry, is it what? Is it possible that? just to get the Boolean straight out, rather than having to pipe it, and then say echo yummy? So if you just go test well, the thing is what you can always what we what you can also always do if you just want to test whether um, minus e uh, dot cfg, and then um, you can look at the you can look at the error code that it returns just like we did last week. I mean this is an error code of one, and that means that it's false. But of course, um, if you do the same thing again, it sets to zero because that's not an error code of the echo command. Um, if you want to save it, you can say like ec for error code equals dollar question mark. And that way, every time you every time you type every time you save this, you have the the result of the command. Does, it answer, you, does this answer your question? Yeah. Is it possible to set that to a variable straight off without having to do the um? The dollar question mark? No. Yeah. No. The rest is cool. Not that I know of. But I mean, it's just one, just... one additional line to, to save the to save the error code. Cause I think it's just funny that you can get the uh, the output of it, but you can't actually see it. Just in the terminal. So right, all good. Just wondering. I don't think you can. No, no, you can't. It would. No. Okay, so um. Let's go back to, to this one here. Um, we have uh, we've seen here that we get to the we, we get a warning 
about the corrupted file, but we don't know which file that is. So what we can do is to write a little bit more, a little bit longer script. Um, And now we save the, the error code. And we can we can see directly see uh, we can do we we can do that. So if, if you have here, we, feel free to look through this thing. Um, but we can negate an expression. There's only a single one. So if, if the error code is not zero, then echo file dollar f. Underscore, of course. And now I can see that um, now it gives me the error and it tells me which file the error was in. But that gets a lot of, but that's getting a lot of typing. So let's go to the next part of this, and this is shell scripting. Um, programmers are lazy, and that's why scripts come in. Um, we go to the molecules directory, and um, we have a look at the we have a look at the contents. Um, This is just data files, okay? I've just used, I, I don't, it's, um, I want to find out, some, I want to create a script that prints out just a certain subset or subsection, the subset of these lines. Now we have, um, we already have head, which prints the first N lines, and we have tail, which prints which prints the uh, bottom end lines, but we don't have anything middle. So if we want to do something like that, we can could write ourselves a so we can write ourselves um, our own script. Let's just say, let's say. Um, we first get the first 15 lines of the octane, um, the PDB, PDB, PDB. And then we pipe the output into a tail command um, to get just the last five lines of that. So that means that um, at first we get lines one through 15, but um, from these lines, we only select the last five so we should get lines 11 through 15. Um, and then I can say bash middle.sh, and that's exactly um, what we get. So we look at Vim. So we get here was we should get these these line, these five lines.
And that's exactly what we get here from, from 9 to 13. But now we've just moved the typing into a script, which makes it actually a little bit more harder. So what do we want to do? Um, we want to have this script more, more, more modular. So what we now do is we want to say we want to use it on any on different um, variables. Oops. So, so yeah, using bi too much. Um, so what I'm now doing is again because I'm going to use variables, I'm surrounding them by double quotation marks. So that just to make sure that um, I get that that it doesn't blow that it doesn't blow up if I if I get something if some if I get something weird, and I say dollar one, one, dollar one means the first argument passed to this pro, to this script. So if I now use bash middle there, we get no no such file directory, but now we I have to. I have to give it the file name, but I can also give give it a different file name, and it will then work on a different file. Um, Forgot to bring up the um, let me quickly ch check something. I want to bring up my slides. So um, have a go and modify this middle sh in such a way that you can select these two um, these, the 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 end the last line that it should print and the number of lines that before that that it should print so that if you if you were to run um, this command bash middle sh octane ten three it would print out these these lines, which are lines um, 8, 9, and 10 of the, fi of the file. Okay. Did you make some progress? Someone having difficulties? So what we need to do is, of course, first um, the rear, the last line that we want to do is, is um, 
the second or is obviously the second argument that we should get. So if you look at the if you look at this thing, this line, oops. Ah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then in here we use dollar three. So now now we get exactly what we want and if we in change the numbers we get more lines. So what if we have an unknown number of arguments? In this in the script. So if you remember from one of, from week one or from week two, um, if we wanted to list the length of the of the of the files um, in number of lines, and these we want to sort them, you would have done something like that, and that um, and that sorts them. But this also means um what the what the bash does it bash pipes all ex expands this this term here and basically prints all the things um, in, into the command line we don't know how many there are so so in order to do that um, We say dollar and then the um, add sign, and these this special um, variable means all the arguments in our shell. That all the all the arguments that were passed to our program to our to our script. So. Yeah, why did I use PY? So, and um, and that's how that's basically how I do it. You can you can actually add um, you can add other other lines as well. So um, uh, I think there's yes. So we can we can actually add. Uh, more more programs. So all of that gets combined, and we get um, we can use this. These scripts can become quite large, particularly if they do very specific things that you want to do. You might want to you get some. And one of the most common program in uh, one of the most common things to get to keep some sort of overview about what's happening, why. Is comments, and so the shell also has comments, and that in 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 the bash, um, the, the sign that something is a comment is the octothorpe or the hash hashtag or the pound sign. So methane octane um, and hashtag propane. So in this. If I were to just use this, ls would just print, the, just list these files. But if I am, if anywhere outside of quotation marks, I add this octothorpe here, bash will treat everything behind that part, behind this, as a comment. So for that reason, I only get the first two listed but not the propane anymore because it says, okay, that was just a comment. That was just something that he wanted to note. So you could say, um, uh, list. 
you can write something human readable, um, and it's and, and um, Bash will not care about it. Now you will you will rarely do this inside um, the command line interface, but in shell scripting, you would do that um, quite a bit. So you might say you might, for example, give it um, uh, you, 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 a shell script. You might want to start with um, uh, you might give it some. You might write what what the script does at the beginning, so that you immediately know what to, what you do is. Or you say. Um, uh, or you can say how how this program should be used. Um, so all these all these lines will be ignored by Bash because they because they they start with the octothorpe and there's nothing in it except for nothing before the octothorpe. So nothing in there will be uh, will be done. And then it will go all the way straight to the word count program um, to run it. So it's, it still works the same way. It doesn't do anything. But you still always run bash sort sh. Uh, we don't. We do not execute the program directly. But instead, we we tell uh, we have to run bash and give the sort.sh as an argument. How do we get around that? And therefore, we need two things. The first thing is a shebang. And the shebang uses the octothorp followed by an exclamation mark. And that is it. Ha that has to be the first two characters on the first line, octothorpe exclamation mark, and immediately followed by the interpret by, by the program that should, that should be used to interpret this script. Um, and bin bash is practically always in this particular location for this exact reason, because it's so common that it has to be that, that you want to use that. Um, this is called a shebang. Don't don't ask me where it comes where this name comes from, but um, this has to be uh, this has to be there. You can use others. Um, you can you can use other uh, programs to interpret this. Um, and if you want to know, okay, where is it? Uh, you can use always. You can you should always. You can always use the which command. So in this case, which bash? I'm using slash bin slash bash. Or which Python? And Python also use the, the uh, you can use the same with Python as well. You can use a Py if you if you have a Python script, you start up with uh, octothorpe exclamation mark. In this case, opt local bin Python. Um, This is the first thing we need to do. We need to add this shebang to tell the to tell Bash uh, which interpreter to use for this program. And the second thing is we need to make it executable. Now, if you look at this, uh, if you look at the uh, at the long long list of the of the permissions, you have up here you have uh, certain permissions, certain permission flags. The first one is uh, what kind of file it is. Usually, a file just have a slash, but for example, a directory or a link might have something standing there. And then you have three parts of three um, letters each, RWX, read, write, executable. Um, the first one is for the user. So the user is, in this case, myself. I have the permission to read and write this. Um, the group which is everyone who is part of Monash domain users in this case, has only the permission to read. And others 
everyone else who has an account on this machine also has the right to read it. Change permission, change what, uh, uh, change them, um, they can change it, say plus x, plus executable. And if I now look this, then you see that everyone, including myself, group, and other have received the X flag. So we can now execute it. But this still doesn't work because it doesn't find the program. And that is because you have a special variable called path. And that shows that tells Bish, uh, Bash where to look, where to look for in um, in uh, dark, where to look for in uh, programs, and you can see that the co current directory is not part of this Bash. So it's it's so opt local bin, opt local s bin, anaconda bin, and so on. Um, but I can just use a relative path to it. And that works. Or I can use, or I can set the, or I can append the current directory to the path, which is something that isn't very good to do, isn't a very good thing to do, but of course, but some people do it. And then, uh, then it would also work because then it find then it can find the script. Hold that. Yes. Um, could you just explain why it wouldn't be a good thing to do? Could I explain why? Why it wouldn't be a good thing to make your current directory on the path? Um. To be honest, uh, I heard that it is a security. Um, danger. So someone might tell, might um, if 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 I could trick you into downloading something from me, and I have a program called ls inside this directory, um, then if you are inside my directory and type ls, it might not run the the one that you expect to that lists the contents of the file directory. It might run my program. Um, but if you look at um, at Raijin, um if you don't have uh, if you have a look at your at your uh, modules that are automatically loaded, so if I have if I look at my path and if I lose, load the module dot. And then it does exactly the same thing. The the dot module that Raijin auto a module that Raijin by default loads does this. So I don't think it's that dangerous for users. It might be you certainly don't would not want to have that running if you have if you are, are a super user. Um, because that then users could trick you into running uh, arbitrary commands very easily. But um, um, yeah, it's I I don't like it. Um, I don't I don't know whether there is a particular reason not to do it. Okay, thanks. So we've had a few. We've had a few um, uh, uh, special variables for this for the scripts, but there are two. But here are two more: dollar zero and dollar octothor. Find out what can can you check what have a have a go see if you can figure out what these two uh, special variables are.
some numbers. Okay, so I've, I've revealed the, the solutions. Oh. The first one is the name of the script itself. And the second one is the number of arguments. Um, and let's, let's use this all to make the middle of sh um, more convenient. At the moment we say we have to print, we have to tell it the last line, which is a little bit weird. We usually conveniently would ask from the first line then how many characters. So So first we start with a shebang. Bin bash. Then we set a file. And we say So we give some information about it. And then we check whether it's actually executed correctly. If the number of arguments is exactly three, or is not equal to three, then we print the help. So I've, I've used a multi-line, um, I've used a multi-line echo that, that, but that does work. And then we say exit one. So this is exit with an error code of one. If this doesn't work, so let's let's try it out. That's why we test things. So if I now, if I don't print it with the correct number of uh, arguments, it prints out, um, it prints out the, the help, and even has replaced this um, this thing uh, with how we called it. And and should it, yeah, it has returned the one error code. So let's go. Let's next check whether um, the first argument that we got is actually um, a file. Uh, so I'm using the minus F one here, not the minus E, because minus E also returns true if it's a directory, but we don't only want files. So if it's not a file, then So that also works. So we got past, we, we, we entered three arguments, but the first one was not a file or it does not exist. So um, we, get, we get this error. And now let's make some
Let's make some calculations. So we need. I use uh, I use minus i to I use I use the integer integer declaration because we do so we have to do some uh, some um, uh, some calculations. The last line that we want to talk, that, that we want to print is uh, dollar two plus dollar three minus one. Okay, let's let's say in So I've I've now just uh, to make it more readable. I've also uh, declared variables for file and length. Come on, middle uh, octane three five. That's that's this prints out three. Uh, from starting from line number three, um, five lines. Now, this is an example to use uh, to use everything we've learned so far in this course, um, or many things that we've learned so far. This is certainly not the best way to to implement this kind of issue, um, but uh, I I hope that you get some some idea about how. Um, how these things can be used, how, how shell scripts can work together. Um, most of the times you will write your own shell scripts to do a very specific thing over and over and over. Um, and basically most of these things grow over time or, or are done for a very specific purpose. And so there is, as long as it does what you need it to do, um, there isn't really any uh, to problematic issue is um, you don't need to be very very effective efficient or something like that but um, you need to understand what it does um, and uh, you need to be able to uh, to so that, that that's easier to edit okay and this is this concludes our bash training of course Bash is far more powerful than the things that I was able to talk about in four one-hour sessions. Um, but Bash is also very so popular that there is that there are lots of documentation out there. And um, if you want to do a certain thing, uh, just type into Google Bash and whatever that, whatever you want to do, um, and it should find some good links for you. Um, are there any questions about scripts? Are there any quest other questions about shell, about the bash, anything that we've done this today or, or the last few weeks? Okay, I don't hear anything. Um, then Thank you very much for attending. Um, I hope you learned something. And next week, I'll be talking about version control with Git. Um, it's a very useful, it's a surprisingly useful tool. Um, and I would strongly recommend you come to see what it does. Because other than while the shell, you realize how much you need it. With version control, you might not immediately see how much you need it until it's too late. So uh, I strongly recommend you come next week to my Git session. Um, I will be using Git from the command line next week, and the week afterwards, uh, you will get the same thing again with the, with the graphical user interface. Um, so yes, we really want you to use version control. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, Thanks, uh, Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>